Welcome to today's video, where we dive into the scariest stories that people know are completely true. These aren't just urban legends, they're experiences that have actually happened. So sit tight, turn the lights down, let's get started and don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy the video. My family actually experienced some paranormal activities. When my mom was pregnant, she said she saw the spirit of her father coming through the window in the house where we lived at the time. And she believed she would die if he touched her. She didn't die, but my young sister-to-be at the time was stillborn. There was a lot of weird activity at that house when we lived there. I was only about six, but I wasn't one for sleeping at night. I had trouble sleeping and remember looking out of the window one particular night, definitely past midnight. I saw these two creatures peering back in, and it took me a minute to scream. My parents came running in, and my dad looked outside but didn't find anything. Later on, I got to thinking it was two Indians dressed up for a powwow in the area, but what they were doing on our property, I don't know. I also thought it could have been two Bigfoots, as what I remember also matched their descriptions. We later lived in a two-story house and were always hearing noises upstairs. We would investigate but never find anything until one summer day, when we heard the noises again. My brother went up the stairs outside, which were old and rickety but could support his weight. I went up the front stairs, and they were coming down. I was greeted by two Indians who said they were looking for a couple of their friends. They apologized, not realizing both floors were occupied by my family. They exited the house, and Mr. Brother and I followed them out, but they were gone in a matter of seconds, and neither of us saw which way they went. We believed they were ghosts because of how fast they disappeared. As I said, my brother and I were right behind them, and they had no time to head north or south, across the street, or in the back of the house. We would have seen them. They disappeared straight into thin air. I grew up with a belief in the paranormal, especially a strong belief in ghosts. I worked the night shift and frequently would leave early in the morning, and my hair would stand on its end. That was a signal to get to the car as fast as possible and lock the doors. I never knew what it was that was spooking me, but unlike other ghosts I felt were friendly, I wasn't sure these spooks had good intentions. I would always drive around the house to see if I could see anything, as my parents were still living at the time, and I didn't want to leave them in danger. I never saw anything. I once swiped right on a girl on Tinder, but it didn't match. She was fairly recognizable to me for reasons I won't list, and a couple days later I saw her out at a restaurant. I didn't say anything to her because I didn't want to be that weird guy. The very next morning, as I'm walking into work, I get a call from the charged nurse saying they have a cat one trauma coming in that will be coming straight up to the or penetrating injuries. I'm an anesthesiologist. The girl looks familiar, the name sounds familiar, and it quickly dawns on me that it was her. I'd only been at this job a couple months, straight out of residency, and this was my first bad solo trauma here. I have four surgeons operating at once, and I'm just scrambling to keep her alive. It was so bad that I had to put a dorsalis pedis arterial line in her foot. Thankfully, she lived and did well, and I actually did the anesthesia for several of her follow-up surgeries over the next few months. I never brought up Tinder or the fact that I had just seen her the day before. I'm a professional ballet dancer. I've been dancing for 15 years. When I was 10 or 11, I attended my local ballet studio summer program just so I could stay in shape over the summer and continue working on my technique. During the week, we would work on pieces of choreography that we would present to our parents at the end of the program. This one week, on the very last day of classes, about a half hour before our performance, a SWAT team entered our studio and instructed us to evacuate and move to a secure location, so we picked up our stuff and moved to another building a block away. Many people just wanted to leave, but we unfortunately weren't allowed to because the police had closed down the entire block. We were locked down for about five hours and ended up doing our performance in a narrow hallway of an office building. When we were finally released, we found out that the bank next to our ballet school was being robbed. The robbers took hostages and threatened to blow the entire building sky high if the police didn't meet their demands, to this day, I'm unsure what they wanted. My dad showed me photos of armored cars and officers in full gear, guns drawn, trying to take these guys out. In the end, they were all taken out, and I was able to go home and have a good night's sleep. I'm also unsure if the robbers even had explosives or not. I still think about it to this day and joke about it with my friends. Back in the 90s in Korea, there was a guy who we all thought was kind of crazy who lived in this kind of rundown underground? Home, kind of like a bunker. One day he comes up to my friend group and asks where one of my friends is and tells us that he needs to talk to him, and if we do, we'll all get a dollar each. My friends and I naturally go looking and tell our friend that the crazy guy wants to talk to him, 
and when we get to his place, he takes our friend and drags him in. At that point, we're panicking, and we just start screaming at the top of our lungs for help. Thankfully, some adults and parents were around and rushed to help and got our friend out, and they all told us everything was okay, but I still don't know what happened inside. About 13 years ago, I was interning for a really nice guy who owned his own accounting firm. We took Christmas and New Year's Day off, and the day I was supposed to go back to work, I was sick. I tried calling him to tell him I wouldn't be there that day but got no answer. I called and called all weekend but never got an answer, and he never returned my call. I had a bad feeling in my gut, so I had my husband go with me when I returned to work the following Monday. I went in and found a note on my desk from the other lady who worked there part-time. All it said was, please call me. My stomach sank, and when I called her, she informed me that our boss had passed away. Come to find out, he shot himself in the chest at home. His doctor was switching up his mental health medications, and he lost them. The scary thing was that he kept a gun in his office. He could have had a breakdown one day at work, and he could have killed me and himself, or the part-time lady. I'm not saying he was a mean or bad person at all, sometimes people just lose their minds and can't help what they do. When I got a chance to talk to the other lady again, she told me about a time when he had a small meltdown after work one day. She tried to take him to the hospital, but he downright refused. He even jumped out of her car. She said she called him that evening, and he was fine. That was not when he shot himself, the poor woman tried her best to help him, but he was a grown man, and there was really nothing else she could do at that point. He was not threatening to harm her or himself. How about some existential dread to offset all the murder? For anyone too young to remember, in the 1990s there was an outbreak of a new disease, variant Creutzfeldt-Jacobs disease. I probably spelled that wrong, which isn't the scary bit. In cows, it's called mad cow disease. When people get it, it's VCJD. It's caused by prions, which are misfolded proteins that teach other proteins to misfold, and then they turn your brain into Swiss cheese. There are loads of prion diseases in animals. Sheep have scrapie, cows have mad cow, deer have chronic wasting disease, etc. It's all prions. Usually it's a sheep problem or a cow problem, but that shit jumped ship and started killing some people. They died bad deaths. There's no cure or treatment. We can't identify prions until after death, usually, and prions aren't alive so you can't kill them, you have to obliterate them. They can survive on a surface indefinitely. They can get inside of you in an endless amount of ways, even through your eyes. So in the 90s, a few dozen PPL died, everyone was really scared, and then deaths kind of dropped off. And everyone is like few. But then a study in the UK examined the removed appendices, appendices? Of a bunch of different people looking for prions. And they found a fuckton. They expected to find some, but they found astronomically more than expected. The good news is that the prions in your appendix probably don't do much of anything. Bad news is a lot of researchers now think there's going to be a second wave that will be much, much worse. You could be infected for decades and have no idea. You're basically just a ticking time bomb waiting to see if it gets to your brain or not. And there's not really anything you can do about it. Even if you got your appendix removed and tested, that would only tell you if you had prions in your appendix. It could be literally anywhere in your body. But the news gets worse BC now a lot of other researchers believe prion like misfolded proteins actually cause a bunch of diseases, like Alzheimer's and some, or all, types of dementia, MS, ALS, Parkinson's, Huntington's, so many fucking things. And some of those diseases suggest that prions outside of your brain can kill you too, like if they're destroying your motor neurons. Which is all bad. But it gets even worse. BC prions are kind of contagious. In ALS, it seems as if the misfolded proteins start in one motor neuron and then spread to the surrounding ones. They're infectious. Theoretically, you could catch prions from someone else. I was staying at a motel in Colorado when I was 19 on a cross-country road trip. My then-girlfriend and I were packing up the car and getting ready to go when I heard someone yelling from above. There was this guy, and he was screaming at his kids, wife, girlfriend, or whatever she was to him. He slammed the room door shut, and I could hear more screaming. I decided to do the right thing and told security. Then I watched as the guard chastised the man for making too much noise. Guard left, sounds of violence continued, so I did the next right thing and called 911. The cops didn't bother to do much either. Initially, I wanted to get physically involved myself, but I believed, at least to some degree, in the traditional justice system. Now I look back, and it's almost funny in a twisted way, if I had gotten in the middle, the person they'd have taken away and charged with assault would have been me. A few weeks later, 
I was in New Mexico, and this man came pacing around the parking lot of another motel, angrily saying things like, you bitch. I hate you, and stuff like that to this girl who had a baby with her. It was their kid, and she'd done something that he'd taken offense to, and he was pissed. She asked to borrow my phone so she could call a ride, and I stood beside her while this man paced around, glaring at her. Then he got in my face and said, I hate you, too. The scary part of all that to me is just how easily those guys did the things they did right in public, in front of everyone, and no one cared except to the extent that their actions were causing disturbances. It's a moral less world out there. It was not the story that scared me the most, but it makes other people uncomfortable as hell when I tell it. So, I'll tell you guys about Buddy. When I was in high school, I went to class with Buddy. He was that general asshole bully type. He provoked me, so I shot back, you know, normal high school jerk and weird kid dynamic. One day, I walk out of the school on my way home, and Buddy sees me and says, you look like a guy. And I guess he didn't get the memo, so I turned right around and said, that's the point. He stared at me confused for a second before it clicked and finally went, oh, good for you. You still fucking suck. And I just flipped him off. Which made Buddy start yelling shit like the usual empty death threats at me as I left. Weirdly, he didn't follow me or do anything beyond yelling, which was out of character for him. I fully expected him to at least try to throw a punch. After that, though, he didn't really interact with me or bother me again. Dunno why. A year after we graduated, the news broke that Buddy and one or two of his friends were arrested for murdering a guy two towns over. An elderly man was walking home, carrying his groceries, and the two punks thought it would be a good idea to not only rob him but also beat him to death. Luckily, I never saw anything, but from my understanding, someone posted either a photo or video on Snapchat, which basically made it so they couldn't try to get out of it. They're in jail now. Anyway, it turns out that those empty death threats were probably not as empty as I thought. And it's very likely that by outing myself that day, I probably threw him off enough so I didn't get hurt. It's sort of scary how many times I've come close to death. My dad used to own a boat, and for Easter in around the 90s, he decided to take my mom, my cousins, and my aunt and uncle out for a ride on the boat. He was going barely 10 miles an hour when he hit a sandbar, and the windshield of the boat went through his face. He and my mom have both told me how it sounded like an eggshell cracking. Today, my dad can barely breathe because his sinuses basically got split. Not really scary, but I can't imagine witnessing something horrific like that. As a child, I'd also have to watch him come home from surgery with bandages all over his face, and most of the time I didn't even know who he was. They also said that his eyeballs popped out at one point or something. Harry Street. He made claims that his neighbor's kids were deliberately taunting and bullying him, which the neighbors didn't believe since the kids weren't playing outside at the time. But Harry made a serious threat against the kids, causing their father to call the police and report the threat. The cops take the threat seriously, with one junior officer at least assigned to run a background check on street. But she discovers there were no records before the mid-90s. No criminal complaints, no driver's license, no birth certificate, nothing. This tells her that there is something unusual about Street and that he's likely a felon whose record was sealed, and he was given a new name. Since they switched over to digital records in the 1990s, that means that the police likely lost his original paper copy criminal record. She goes looking for it and finds it. And he calls the family to tell them that they need to get the fuck out of that house right now. Armed response kicks the suspect's door in and finds that his house is full of both illegally obtained and handmade pistols, revolvers, shotguns, bullets, and pipe bombs, with evidence that he was expressly planning to commit a massacre. The junior officer discovered that Harry Street, as he was then known, was originally known as Barry Williams, and as a result of paranoid schizophrenia, he went on a mass shooting rampage in the 1970s that started when his delusions told him his neighbors were bullying him and he decided to attempt a familicide before killing two additional people while stealing gas for a car he had stolen. He was declared insane and submitted for treatment for roughly 20 years before being released in the 1990s, when he emigrated to Spain, which is when the police lost him. I wouldn't say scary, but a guy from my hometown who was in my grade in high school was deemed a hero when he saved someone from a burning home after the house exploded. The story was that there was a meth lab in the garage, and it exploded, and half the house was obliterated, with the top of the house crashing down into the front lawn and partially on fire. This guy from my high school smashed into the windows that would have been the bedroom windows on the second floor and pulled out an elderly woman who was a tenant of the meth lab owner's house. The news portrayed him as a hero, but what very few people know, which I learned from murmuring between friend groups, is that this guy, the hero, 
was actually going through the neighborhood stealing shit from people's garages. When he broke into the garage, the machine exploded, probably throwing him back 20 feet. He then panicked and heard someone screaming and jumped in to save them, which is partially redeeming for sure. The reason I believe in the rumor is because, about a month prior, a brother friend caught someone stealing a skateboard from their garage and knew the guy because he was a neighbor. When I answered a Craigslist ad for a farmhand in Burlington, Vermont, I had to go to a farmer's market in Middlebury to meet them. They literally put me in a white van and took me even further south to a small town called Brandon. As soon as I got there, they directed me to this barn where they were housing a bunch of pigs. There was this mentally challenged dude and this traveler hippie. The mentally challenged dude first said, welcome home, dude. I stayed there the night, and as soon as the sun came up, they pulled me out and gave me my first job, core tomatoes. As soon as I was there, he turned mean. I, ah, uh, packed my bag and began walking north towards Burlington. I hitchhiked that entire side of that state. Solid 12-13 hours back to Burlington. Back when Around Destiny 1 was released, I started playing with a friend I hadn't hung out with in years from high school. We joked, fucked around, and had fun like we used to be around each other. A month later, he just stops logging on, and about a week after that, a news story breaks about how they had finally found the shooter who had shot someone in the head during a home invasion three months beforehand. It was him. The realization that I had been virtually hanging out with a murderer who had no remorse or even a slight personality change from killing someone to stealing random shit still makes me feel sick inside. The worst part of it all, though? His father was a surgeon. His family had all of the money in the world, and he never had any reason to be involved in a home invasion, but he started hanging out with the wrong people, and I assume he thought being a gangster was cool. An elderly man visited his wife, who was living in a home for seniors, on her birthday, hugged and kissed her, and went to the car to fetch her birthday present, only to return with a loaded gun and blow her head off on the front steps of the home. There's still a stain on those steps to this day, and I'll never set foot on that property again. I dated the grandchild of the owner and spent a few nights there with her. I found record books dating back to the Civil War and even saw an executioner's leather coat hanging stiff on a hook in the records room. The basement had two levels, with one being used as jail cells for the mentally ill and the other for the boilers to heat the place, and God knows what. The barn had an old rocking chair that never stopped rocking, and the butcher's shed was freezing cold in the middle of August. I saw things fly across the rooms, and the piano would always play a couple keys by itself around the same time every day. The most haunted place I've ever been to. Okay, so this one is personal because it happened to me directly. A lot of details are fuzzy, and I haven't told them in a while, so bear with me. When I was little, like seven maybe, I got kidnapped by my mom's obsessive ex-boyfriend. I remember that I was staying with her for the week and we both needed a ride somewhere, and he was the first person she thought to call, I guess. He drove us to a place I had never seen before, and my mom was angry at him, and they started fighting. I guess it was his house or something, because he told me to go inside and eat some chips while they fought. I'm not sure how long I waited, but eventually he came inside and just started casually talking to me. My mom was nowhere to be seen, but he wouldn't answer me when I asked where she was. For the next few days, I just kind of lived with him. He didn't seem that weird, he would talk to me and feed me, but otherwise he would just let me do my own thing. I was starting to get anxious about where my mom was and wanted to look for her, but this place was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by nothing but woods, so I was a little scared to just go wandering. I started noticing some weird stuff, like how his van wasn't where it was when I went inside, or how he would just disappear for hours and then come back and make us soup like nothing had happened. As if it were just normal. Maybe four days in, at around 2 AM, I felt someone shaking me from where I was sleeping on the couch, the house only had one bedroom, and I guess he didn't quite feel that nice, and when I opened my eyes, I saw it was my mom. She kind of half carried, half dragged me outside, and I was too nervous and confused to ask any of the many questions I had. She took me through the woods and eventually to the van that I hadn't seen since she disappeared, and she started it up as quickly as she could and drove us away, I'm not sure how she got the key, maybe he left it on the coffee table or something. She took us to the closest house and used their phone to call the police. What had happened was that after she got into an argument with her ex, he strangled her until she passed out and drove the van with her in it down a path into the forest. He had her tied up there for days and was visiting her to basically torture her all while I was in the house with him. Yeah. Now here's the thing, my mother stinks. She's not a good person and hasn't been for a very long time, but even now, knowing what I know about her, the fact that she went through that makes my skin crawl. What unsettles me the most, though, is how I was just with him. He seemed so deceptively normal. He was never mean to me, 
He never tried to hurt me, it was like I was just some kid he had to take care of now. He didn't expect me to be there, but I was. I wonder why he didn't do anything to me, maybe he thought about it but just never went through with it. Maybe I don't want to know. From my own personal experience, when I was 16 or 17, I drove over to my friend's house to pick him up before going out to a movie sometime around 8 p.m., and I noticed a man kneeling behind a parked car next to my friend's house as I drove away. I told my friend, hey, did you see that? That man behind that car? To which my buddy said no, why would there be someone behind a car? I told him I swear I saw someone, but this was before the time of cell phones being a common thing, so neither of us had one to call my friend's parents to tell them to be careful or look outside to make sure. Now keep in mind that he lived in a very quiet suburban neighborhood, so stuff like this never happens, so of course my buddy thinks I'm messing with him or I'm just seeing stuff. Now, we both forget about this incident, go to the movies, and enjoy the rest of the night. We both come back way later, around midnight, and we discover a ton of police cars with their lights on next to my friend's house. We get out and discover that his neighbor's house was broken into, and the burglar was shot in the process. Apparently the guy had a bag full of rope and tape and was fully planning on using it on whomever was in that house. For weeks, I was completely freaked out and wouldn't be able to go outside at night without checking all over the place for people hiding. It was insane to me that I spotted a glimpse of the guy, and since I didn't have a cell phone or any feeling of validity, I couldn't warn someone ahead of time. One night, when a friend and I were in ninth grade, he was staying at my house over the weekend. He needed to cut weight for wrestling, so we went out for a run. It was about 10 p.m., and this was late December in Minnesota, so there was about 8 inches of fresh snowfall. Towards the end of the run, we turned to a dead end that we would use as a turnaround point, and there was an old jeep sitting there idle in the middle of the street at the end. It gave me bad vibes, so I told my friend we should turn around where we were, but he insisted it was fine. As we passed the jeep, out of nowhere he threw it into gear and accelerated directly toward my friend and me, if it weren't so snowy, he would have run us over no problem. After that, we started running toward my home, which was a couple blocks away yet. Because of how deep the snow was piled off of sidewalks and streets, we had to stay on the sidewalks to move at any meaningful pace, and in the time it took us to get home, he rammed snowbanks next to us five times. When we finally got home, the guy was sitting in our yard spinning his tires, so my older brother, 19 at the time, grabbed an unloaded shotgun from our father's gun safe, then walked outside and pumped it and leveled it at the jeep. The guy drove out of our yard and ran over our mailbox, but my brother managed to get his license plate, so we called the cops. The cops did nothing about it whatsoever, they assumed we must have provoked the man in some way or that we were playing a prank. My brother gave the cops the license plate number, but we never heard anything about it when we reached out. My friend and I never went for a night run again, and we never saw the jeep again. <laughs>